Thanks for the intro, Mike. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone, depending on where you are in Australia and the world. Um, so a little bit of other housekeeping, I guess my role here is in chemical structure and reactivity. Um, and what I'm trying to do today is take my understanding of chemical reactivity and present it to you in a way that is understandable. Um, so if at all, if that doesn't come across at all, um, that's even very useful feedback for me because if I'm not quite getting the point across, that's, that's completely my fault. And if there's anything that you miss that doesn't make any sense, feel free to shoot through a comment or an email to me later on saying, yeah, this slide, no, nah, you got it completely wrong. That helps out quite a bit. Um, and also I'm happy for interruptions during. So if people have something really pertinent and they want to send it through ASAP, ASAP, feel free to just shoot it through and I'll try and cover it as we go rather than having to wait till the end. So as Michael said, looking at um, TDN Bottle Age Riesling, and this is a project that we've been working on for a little while now, and it's still ongoing um, between us here at the Australian Wine Research Institute and um, some academics over in Geisenheim University in the, the Rheingau region of Germany. Um, and as you can see from the aeroplane, we've had quite a few students come between the two to work on it. Um, one of which who is still here at the moment, um, Evie um, Yevgenia, who a lot of the work today um, comes from from her masters which she did with us and then her PhD which is currently ongoing. So the world of Riesling, so why are we working with Germany? So I guess you can see from this graph here we've got on the left hand side the share of global Riesling vineyard area um, and the Germans are quite predominant in growing Riesling um, and also on the on the right hand side of that the the share of Riesling of their national vineyard area you can see that it's, it's an important variety for Germany. So you can understand why Germany get into it, um, but Australia down there, so third on the list behind the USA, you know, we've got a decent share of Riesling here in Australia, but it doesn't make up a great deal of our national um, vineyard area or our crush. So you may sort of sit there and go, okay, why, why are we getting involved in this, in this project on Riesling? Well, the next slide I've got is from the 2017 crush, and this graph essentially just shows the crush weight um, of those top 12 or white varieties along the bottom and the average grape price up um, the vertical axis. And as you can see, Chardonnay, it's quite a, quite a workhorse, um, crush quite a lot of it. Riesling, I think, is about seventh or eighth in terms of crush weight. Um, but in terms of average price, it is the highest of that, um, that grouping in terms of average price. Um, but not only is it, a quite quite a, a valuable brand on average, but as you can see from the size of those bubbles, um, they represent what percentage of the the amount of that fruit that's bought in 2017 is worth above $1,500 a ton. So as you can see, that Riesling bubble is actually quite big. So there's quite a lot of Riesling that's in that um, that premium category. So for us, um, it's important because it's it's quite a high value premium white grape variety. So having a look at, at what makes Australian Riesling what it is. So we're looking back on a, a PhD thesis by Heather Smythe from a few years ago, where she took a whole bunch of Rieslings from Australia, looked at the chemistry of those wines and also the sensory. Um, and while there are a lot of trends, there was one main trend in those Australian Rieslings. Uh, and it existed along a single axis, I guess, when you we look at the difference between those samples. At one end, we had um, these really floral, sweet, citrus, tropical Rieslings. Um, and for anyone who really likes chemical structures, there are the, the chemicals underneath. So linalool is one of the monoterpenes, which is known for the, the floral um, tripe type characters you get in um, Riesling, Gewurz, musket varieties, um, phenylethyl acetate, rose water, and um, one of the ac acetate esters for banana. On the other end of this spectrum, we have things like kerosene and petroleum, caramel, honey, lime, getting towards candied fruit, candied citrus, um, and the chemicals that were associated with these are um, 116 trimethyl 12 dihydronaphthalene or TDN, um, dimethyl sulfide, um, and also some of the other esters. So the thing that contributed to this um, spectrum of Riesling was simply the wine age. So at one end, we've got 
young one to two year old Rieslings at the other end, we've got the older cluster. And we see this regularly in Riesling that young Riesling is fresh and fruity and floral and the other end um, starts to get those caramel, honey, cooked fruit um, and a descriptor that some people will refer to as kerosene. So that aged Riesling character, as I was just talking about, the compound itself is 116-trimethyl-12-dihydronaphthalene. Um, and you can understand why we call it TDN when you hear that name. So we've known about this in, in Riesling for quite a number of years. Um, and it has a threshold of around 2 micrograms or PPB um, to 20 micrograms per litre. And thresholds vary depending on who looks at them, how they're determined, what population they're determined in. But it's, it just gives us an idea of whereabouts it is. Um, and that CRT there is a consumer rejection threshold that was done by Ross um, and Co a few years ago. So it has, does, does have to get quite high before people start to go, nah, don't want a bar of it. So the picture I've got there is of some jerry cans because TDN, most people refer to it as kerosene or petrol-like. Um, not everyone does. Um, we show it sometimes to our panels and we get plastic sometimes as a descriptor. Um, often people will refer to it as simply aged Riesling character. Um, the reason I'm going to run with Kero or petrol today is because anytime we give it to, um, to panels to develop their own descriptors for it, with they come back with kerosene. Whether that's a learn trait or not, hey, I'm just going to run with it. So I may offend some people that don't agree with it, but we'll run with it for today. Um, so TDN and, and this age character is actually quite polarizing. Um, some people really, really want it in an aged Riesling. Some people don't want it. Um, definitely in a young Riesling, it's, it's not very good. Um, but it does have to be in balance. It can't just be the sole characteristic. So one of the other things we see with it is it's very stable. So some compounds we see form and then degrade over time. TDN, once it's there, it's there. And it generally just um, builds up and goes from there. So the other thing is this, this compound is it's not solely in Riesling, but we see it in Riesling in much higher concentrations than we see it in anything else. So I'm just going to take you through quickly where it comes from. Um, and again, because I work in chemistry and structure, I like showing the chemical structures. Um, for those that don't really like any chemistry, I've decided to put some Lego bricks behind there um, so that you can just look at, at the building blocks because this, this pathway is essentially what happens in grapes and it's just building up from these little um, isoprene units all the way through um, to the carotenoids, which are right down the bottom there, those 40 carbon units. But along the way, we get one block of five carbons. We go to two blocks of 10 carbons. And from that branch, we actually get um, cyclization, rearrangement, binding to sugar, and we get these sugar-bound monoterpenes in grapes. Um, those are quite a dominant um, varietal characteristic and free monoterpenes, um, once they're split apart, linalool, draniol, nerol, uh, the fruity floral characteristics that you get in muskets, in Riesling, in Gewürz. Um, but they are found in their bound form and are released during fermentation. Um, also from this pathway, once you get 15 units, is also where we start to get sesquiterpenes branching out. So I guess the, the most well-known one is probably um, rotundone in Shiraz. So that comes from this pathway. But what we're talking about today is the formation of the carotenoids, so beta carotene and the like, um, which during berry development get broken apart by enzymes um, into all sorts of different sized molecules. So the C15 abscisic acid, which is a plant hormone, um, is one of them, but also these C13 norisoprenoids. So these again um, are found in, in grapes and often in wine in their bound, non-volatile, non-aromatic glucose bound form which once they are hydrolyzed and rearranged, you get things like beta damascanone, which is stewed apple, uh, beta ionone, which is violet, but also TDN um, and TPB and vitispirane, some of these aged um, type of characters. So as you can see from this pathway, we, we get the norisoprenoids, but it's also pretty important for the monoterpenes and other um, key Riesling flavors. So when we're playing around with understanding this pathway, we also have to check what's happening with monoterpenes, are we taking away from the pool of monoterpenes or are we contributing to it? So I guess a bit of a background to the carotenoids is those are there in grapes as essentially a sunscreen. 
So those do the job of protecting chlorophyll from being broken down by too much energy. So they're a sunscreen a photoprotectant. So essentially the more light energy you have coming into the grape, more, the more the grape needs carotenoids to protect chlorophyll. So that's why we get those in there. So Riesling with age. So a little while ago, we did a survey of 116 commercial Rieslings and we tried to analyze for quite a number of things. Um, this graph here simply shows alpha terpineol, which is one of those monoterpenes. Um, so it's one of the, it's down the pathway a little bit. It's after a few rearrangements. So it's not one of the ones we get right in fresh wine, but it's after a little while we get some alpha terpineol. Um, it has been noted as floral fruity, but it can also be um, resinous and woody. But as you can see, that simply um, degrades over time. And we see that with the monoterpenes. That's why in our young wines, they're driven by those compounds and less so in old wine. And TDN is the opposite. So TDN is generally age is the biggest, biggest um, contributor to, to TDN concentration. So this is some work that was done on South African Riesling um, quite a number of years ago. Um, and I'm showing it just because it had some, um, some analysis of some very good compounds over time. So they took a number of Rieslings, stored them over four years and looked at the compounds that were changing. And it just gives you an idea of how those concentrations change. Um, so in young, we get um, things like ethyl esters, which contribute to banana. And we get um, linalool for the, for the rose. And as you can see, as the wine ages, the esters drop off relatively quickly. There's a bit of a spike in monoterpene as it's released from that bound form over time. And then that slowly degrades. This next peak that I've just put up um, is alpha terpineol. So woody and resinous. I've just got some tree sap there as a picture. And as you can see, because that relies on a few rearrangements and it comes from linalool, the rose one, um, we actually get that being produced more slowly over time and it's a bit more stable. And over a longer period of time, we get a, a slow increase in, in TDN. So I guess the important thing there is these things happen at different speeds. So it's not just that, you know, we just press play and that slowly goes down as this slowly comes up. All these things are interacting and changing at different speeds at different times in the process. So that's what makes it difficult to try and understand. So in that same project, they also got sensory um, scores on those wines and just rated young wine character and kerosene character in those wines. And that was a general trend that we get um, essentially a plateau and then a reduction of this young wine character um, and then a slight increase in what they called the kerosene character. And I think that mimics that first slide I put up on having um, fruity, fresh uh, monoterpene driven wines on one end and, and older wines on the other. So I just wanted to show this quickly. This is obviously quite a few chemical structures, um, but what it shows is those two pathways. The first, <clears throat> the top one, the monoterpene. So that one marked with A, um, obviously in grapes, we've got bound forms. We get released into wine. Um, the nose just shows where there's an aroma. Um, and as you can see, we go through geraniol, linalool, alpha terpineol, and then these things start to form into things that um, we either can't detect or have no smell. Um, whereas in the TDN side of things, the pathway towards formation of TDN doesn't involve aromatic compounds. So rather than getting these nuanced changes, we sort of just slowly get this ramping up of, of kerosene character. So the other thing that's important to note is when we look at analyzing for a wine, if we're talking about young wine or grapes and we want to understand how much TDN is in there, there, there isn't any, so we can't do it. Um, so what we have to do is essentially take those, yeah, that young wine or grapes, um, drop the acid um, or increase the acid, drop the pH, um, and heat it up and we we force that um, formation of TDN which we analyze for and we, we refer to that as total TDN so it's not the amount that's free in the wine that you can smell it's sort of a measure of promised TDN or what will happen down the track so with regards to TDN what do we know about it so we know it comes from carotenoids we know that we get more of it um, as a response to light or sun exposure simply because the carotenoids are sunscreens. So as more light falls on the grapes, they need more sunscreen. And then when they break down, we get more TDN. Um, there is work that shows or that suggests at a higher temperature, so regions with more temperature, you get more TDN. 
Um, I'm going to return to that later. Um, and that there are also some winemaking practices that can affect it. What we really don't know is which exact carotenoid it comes from, the exact pathway of formation. We know parts of that pathway. And we also, because there's this light and temperature um, effect that's hard to separate, we're not exactly sure how it's controlled in the vineyard. So the problem we've got, and while, <clears throat> while we're working the Germ with the Germans, is this whole um, climate change phenomenon, which you may or may not have heard of. So in essence, it, you know, the, the predictions are we're going, going for warmer growing seasons. I mean, yes, it's not simply it's getting warmer. We're getting more extremes of temperature, um, but it's hard for us to plan experiments around extremes of temperature. So we essentially try and map what would happen in a, in a world that's slightly hotter. We get different um, ripening patterns. Um, from our, um, our German collaborators, they're observing higher TDN in younger wines, which is not a good thing. Um, they don't want it there. So um, because our Riesling is inherently higher in TDN, we're working together because they want to take information from us and say, okay, what are you guys doing that's giving high TDN wines? And I guess the reverse is for us, if we've got high TDN wines and we don't want it to get any higher, we can learn from them what are you guys doing that's producing lower TDN wine? So there's a bit of bit of sharing and comparison between the two countries happening in this project. So the difference is, well, it's hotter in Australia. We get more sunlight hours. We've also got very different winemaking practices. So the sort of stuff we're trying to figure out at the moment is, I guess, some solutions for managing TDN. So if we're moving into a scenario where we're going to be producing more of it in the vineyard, how can we um, get around that? Um, there's something marked in red there, better understanding of production of markers for future detection. Not going to cover that today because that's, that's quite <clears throat> involved in a presentation on its own, but it's literally just trying to see if we can, rather than having to analyze for TDN by heating it up, whether we can analyze for it by actually analyzing for the known precursor once we know what it is. Um, obviously understanding the driving forces and understand the difference between the two countries, which will help us modulate it in either country. So when you talk about a warming um, climate and finding ways to produce grapes in a, in a warmer way, um, there are pros and cons for every method. Um, we chose a method that was simple. Um, the pros are that it was simple. The cons are that we use two different sites. So there's always variation in, um, I guess, the microclimate, the soil and things like that. But essentially, we, uh, we had vineyards that were 13.7 kilometres apart as the crow flies, one in the Barossa Valley and one in the Eden Valley. And as you can see from the, um, the terrain cross-section there, we essentially got our change in temperature through altitude. So all the way through this next little bit, the, the red will be referring to the Barossa Valley site because it's warmer, um, the blue, um, the Eden Valley site because it's a little bit colder. So if you've ever used a, a hot cold tap, you're probably well qualified to be able to look at this data. So just a little bit of meteorological data first. Um, so we started getting um, data from the Australian Bureau of Meteorology. We get about 40 years of data that we can average out. Um, and also we've got the German, the Geisenheim in there because I dragged these slides from the talk I gave over there. <clears throat> which is probably why you'll notice that the growing season box there is marked from June to September um, because I changed it for, for European growing season. Um, so what we have there is that the temperature in those two sites, so the, the Brossa Valley and Eden Valley are generally around two degrees different in the growing season and Geisenheim's below that. And when we look at the average daily sol solar radiation um, it's very similar for the two. So that's why we chose sites next to each other because those larger scale um, weather things are more closely aligned and Geisenheim are much lower, but that's generally due to sun hours. So now we've got two sites that differ in temperature, but don't differ, differ in sunlight. So in theory, we've got the, uh, the makings of an okay experiment. So here's how we did it. We had control vines in each site. Um, this is the Barossa vineyard. Um, we leaf plucked to expose them. So obviously more light equals, should equal more TDN. Um, but we also boxed each of those scenarios because the opposite, no light should equal um, a lot less TDN. So just to make sure almost a, a negative control type experiment. 
So again, because we did this on grapes, this is the total TDN. So this is us heating it up and then analyzing for what comes out, sort of the promise of TDN. And as you can see, um, <clears throat> again, I've, I've light, the lighter the red and the blue, the more light they saw and the darker ones are the darker, um, hopefully pretty straightforward. So these control um, here were the second highest and where we had more light, we had more TDN, which is what we expected. And as soon as we boxed them, we got less TDN. Um, interestingly, there was really no difference between those two sites. So what we saw is we had more of an impact from changing light exposure than we did from um, the temperature difference. So I'm not saying that temperature had no effect because we had those two different sites, um, but it suggests that the temperature doesn't have to have an effect. So we also did some monoterpene. Um, the only thing we saw was a bit of a change in linalool, um, but that is below the sensory threshold of linalool. Um, so not reading too much into it. Generally in sun exposed grapes, we do see higher amounts of, of monoterpenes as well. So in 2016, we did use the same sites, but we did something slightly different. So the boxes were good as a negative control, um, but this time we decided to use shade cloth because we thought there's no way people are going to go out to the vineyard and put boxes around every bunch of grapes. It's just, it's a silly thing. So let's see if we can make it a bit more practical, we'll put shade cloth on instead. We'll also grab some commercial sunscreens. So we've got some, a Kaolin and a Canuba wax based sunscreen that's used in, in other crops. Sprayed those on as well. And we also made wines in this year, which means after a while we could put them through sensory. So on the right here is just a spider plot of some of those sensory scores. Um, not a lot really changed. Um, there was a little bit of um, fresh citrus change in those shade clothed. Um, but what we saw in those wines is that it was too much of a hefty shade cloth and we literally just, um, we delayed um, maturity. So it's probably a bit under ripe. Um, the kerosene um, score, we actually did see some kerosene score coming in in those leaf plucked, which was, which was quite scary because it was done about a year after um, fermentation finished this sensory. So after a year we had kerosene character coming out, um, which is definitely not what you're after. Um, so the chemical data, I'm not going to show it, but it follows the same trend as 2015. So higher TDN in, in more light. We didn't get much difference between the two sites. Um, the commercial sunscreens didn't really show too much going on. So probably not something to, to look into in this space. And we haven't done it since that vintage. Um, we got work on going on TDM precursors. And again, that leaf plucked. Um, having kerosene in wine after a year was, was interesting. So we had a bit of a break in 2017 um, and came back again in 2018 to start looking um, at shade cloth again. Because that was something that we thought, well, it's, it's having an effect. We're reducing the amount of TDN and things that turn into TDN. But we just reduced photosynthesis too much. So this vintage, we actually rolled shade cloth down each side of the vine. So you can see from that picture there to hopefully shade the bunch zone um, so that we're not getting light in the grapes, but we're still allowing the canopy to receive light and perform its, <clears throat> it's what it does. But we also used a few different colors here because they let through different wavelengths and we can start to understand what wavelengths of light are more important to block out. And I've just included a photo of me in the vineyard drinking a coffee because people don't think I go into vineyards. So that's just to prove that I, I did once go into a vineyard to drink coffee. So from those trials that we've done so far, um, we've seen that sun exposure is a bigger driver than between those sites. And that's really good news because if we're going into a warmer climate, um, it's good that temperature isn't the biggest driver that we can actually do things with our canopy architecture and change the light interception for those grapes um, and change our TDN. Those highly exposed grapes, we see it all the time, kerosene though after a year, um, that a good sensory panel can pick up definitely after two years, which is, is quite scary because that's the thing we're trying to avoid. Um, and we may not have much coming out of commercial sunscreens. So I told you <clears throat> before that I wanted to come back and have a look at this hotter equals more TDN. And this is something that's been around um, for a number of years. So you can see the reference down the bottom is from 1992. And these guys in um, guys 
I should be gender neutral. These people in, um, in South Africa took a whole bunch of wines from different um, places. So they, South Africa and a few different regions, a few places in Germany and a few places in Northern Italy um, and measured TDM with a whole bunch of other stuff as well. So you can see there the ripening temperature. So the South African grapes grown in a, a warmer place, daily sun hours, a lot warmer, uh, sorry, a lot more sun hours in South Africa. And we also got more TDN in the South African wine than we did in Germany and Northern Italy. So I've just got some quotes out of that paper there because I think it, it sort of shows where it came from. Um, Cause the first one there, climate factors cannot be evaluated in isolation. Um, complicated interaction with various other factors. So they saw what we saw that when you've got temperature and light together, it's hard to, to separate them. Um, what we've seen in our work is most of the heat appears to come from the sun. I think there may be some, something in that um, and it's hard to separate those two out. They also said sunlight and temperature may be selected as important factors playing an important role and that was to do with the wine in general. Um, and then in their conclusions, um, it finishes off with with, with regard to TDN, um, that it's responsible for a marked age bouquet um, from warm regions to those from cool regions. So this, was, this is something that it's just the message just tweaked slightly from the discussion of the paper to the, to the conclusions. And I think people pick up on that as saying, okay, look, let's just skim the data. Let's look at this. Okay, warm, hot. We've got these differences. But they actually did say, we don't know which it is. The way they've worded their conclusions, I think that's where it's come from. So I'm not saying that temperature isn't a factor. It's just that I think people have separated that out without having a proper justification for it. So now I'm going to take you on a quick trip to Germany. So I went there last year. Um, and the one thing I noticed, well, I mean, you can probably see the difference between the vineyard there and what we have here. I stood in the vineyard and I went to raise my head up to look in the, the middle of the sky for the sun and it wasn't there. So I haven't spent a lot of time in Europe in my life, but obviously the sun is in a different spot. Um, you know, they're 50 degrees North. I'm in Adelaide at 35 degrees South. So there's a bit of a difference, but these guys also run a very, very narrow row width. So two meters apart at the most, they don't drive between them. They got big tractors that harvest from over the top. So <clears throat> they've got row, narrower row widths they got the sun not as high in the sky and you can see from those little pictures that I've done. So this is looking down an east west row. If you couldn't tell from my fantastic illustrations, um, we've got, you know, a roughly three meter row spacing. If they've got a two, 2.1, our sun's higher. We spend a lot more time with sun shining on the, the bunches than they do. So I just spent a bit of time investigating this. Um, so, went on and just had a look at the sun path. This is in January for us and July for Geisenheim. Um, that's just the sun path throughout the year. And it's hard to tell, but the, the dots I'm looking at are the, the second highest ones there because <clears throat> the top ones are 21st of December in the solstice, the second one, 21st of January for us and 21st of May for them. And I've just put a line at 60 degrees. So when the sun is 60 degrees above the horizon. And as you can see, it's just a, it's just in a random elevation that I've picked for no particular reason. But at that elevation, our sun, our sun, well, it's, it's, it's the same sun. I have checked it. Um, the sun, we have four hours above that elevation. They only have one hour. So, you know, pretty obvious that our sun's getting up higher, shining in between those rows a lot more. So what I wanted to do is just have a quick um, play with some maths. So I'm not a, not a overly complex sort of dude. Um, so I literally just drew two vines next to each other, worked out the drop from the top of one canopy to the grape, <clears throat> grapes on the row next to it, drew a triangle and worked out the angle of that triangle using a bit of high school geometry. So I did this at a flat vineyard with a two meter row spacing and saw that, you know, a rough elevation of 26 degrees gets you sun on those grapes. If you get a bit of a slope, just because our vineyard, our Geisenheim vineyard is definitely sloped and our Eden Valley um, has a bit of slope to it that you change the height that you need. And we've got a 24 degree elevation before we're exposed. And if we stretch that row spacing out with a bit of elevation, that changes again. And you only need 15 to 16 degrees of sun elevation before you're shining in on that. 
so this this vineyard um, setup um, does play quite a big role if we're talking about sun exposure. So what I did is I just took these calculations to extreme. Um, this is for Geisenheim, just because I wanted to put crosses all over it to show you where I did calculations. So two, 2.5, three, 3.5 and four meter row spacing with a vineyard slope of minus 10, minus five, zero, five and 10 um, percent towards sun. So percentage in terms of rise over run, I think 5% is roughly 2.7 or 2.8 degrees of those that want to use the degree scale and basically just did the calculations and then smooth those into a contour plot so i'm in adelaide so again i did it for adelaide because i can't do every latitude going around well i could but it's going to take me a while um so geisenheim's 50 degrees north we're 35 degrees south um as you can see there's a bit of bit of shift there in in how a vineyard is set up to how much exposure an east west row would get so going from two and a half to five, three and a half meter row spacing, you go from eight hours and 15 minutes of full sun exposure to nine hours and 20. So you get about an extra 20, uh, about an extra hour. And obviously just by changing the slope, which is probably more likely to change as you go through an undulating vineyard, you can change the exposure for those grapes by an hour as well. So something to think about. Um, if you've got a, a vineyard with a bit of contour to it that, you know, there's something, something going on there. So apart from the vineyard, I also spoke about, we know there are some winemaking factors that can contribute. So this is um, a pathway for formation. Um, again, using Lego blocks, just for those that really don't like chemical structures, but we start at the carotenoids. Those get broken down in the grapes to these bound forms, which then get released. And what we have with TDN is yeast plays a bit of a role. So these yellow blocks, um, yeast comes in and changes them slightly. So we go from two yellow blocks to a purple and a yellow or a green and a yellow. Um, and only one of these pathways is known to produce TDN. So yeast can have an impact on where it sends um, the carbon, where it sends the, the, the compounds, which path it's using. So this is something that came out of a, a PhD thesis um, from um, Braunschweig in Germany. And we've done some work on yeast here. We do see some differences, but they, at this point, they don't seem to undo the exposure from the vineyard. So it's not like we can take very exposed grapes, put the right yeast in there and redirect it enough. Um, but we're still working in this space. So hopefully something comes of it. Um, pH is definitely a driving force. So this is work from out of the AWRI in um, the late 2000s, where they took something in that TDN formation pathway, stored it at two different pHs. So the red line there is pH 3, the blue line pH 2. And as you can see, that's the production of TDN from that compound. So they got much quicker um, formation of TDN from that precursor. And we see that regularly through these pathways that um, the more acid, the quicker these pathways happen. Closure is probably a very big one and probably something that differs between Germany and Australia. Um, so that graph I showed before of TDN with age, this is it with separated into closure. <clears throat> so screw cap in red and cork in blue. Um, as you can see, the screw capped wine as it ages, it continues to accumulate TDN and the cork not so it starts to plateau. Now this is, could be two different, reasons so i guess we did a lot of work um a while ago on scalping um with semion so we spiked compounds into into semion and saw what was pulled out um, and tdn is one that was seen to be removed um differently um, by different closures um you can understand it because tdn's hydro hydrophobic yeah that's the one um it really doesn't like being in water um it's like oil and water don't mix it wants to be somewhere else so I can understand it trying to escape and go somewhere else. Um, but in that work, um, I guess they had all the controls are in place, um, but there was no um, recovery of those compounds from the closures. So pretty confident that it was scalping, um, but you can never be 100%. But there's also oxidation, which can be an issue. Um, so in a, with similar closures, uh, some oxidation work was done on Riesling and there was a lot of, a lot of oxidation color change um, and oxidative sensory scores coming out of that wine. Um, and we're starting to, to investigate oxidation as a possible pathway for 
for TDN changes. So the closure does have an impact. Um, scalping, yes. Oxidation, maybe. <clears throat> Obviously, that pH, um, those, acid, those a lot of those reactions are mediated by acid. So the more acid we have, the lower the pH, the more reaction we get. We have seen some other drivers, um, so nitrogen and water status. Um, but I guess most people presume that um, those are drivers of canopy size and architecture. So it's not that those things are directly impacting TDN, it's those that are impacting the architecture, which is impacting sunlight, which is impacting TDN. So there are a few things that, that can be done. Um, but the next part of this talk, I want to look at, at predicting TDN, because as I showed before, in young wine, we can't analyze for what's not there. And the problem is if we want to start looking at what happens in a five to 10 year old Riesling, we want to do a trial, analyze for what happened. And we want to do that again the next year with some slightly different things. And then a year, again, you know, we're talking about 15 to 30 years before we have an answer for you. And I don't think you guys want to be waiting 30 years for us to tell you what's going to happen in aged Riesling. So the things we can do is if anyone's ever done um, some smoke tan analysis, we can understand what turns into um, TDN or in, the, in that case, what turns into um, guaiacol and the like and analyze for those and then start to develop models for um, how much gets broken down during fermentation, during bottle aging. But at this point, we don't know what we would be looking for, which is something we're working on. So the other thing we can do is create an environment where these formations happen more quickly. We call it accelerated aging. It's quite a tricky one to do because <clears throat> These days, it generally involves heating wine a bit. But if you've ever tasted badly stored wine, you don't just end up with aged wine. You end up with knackered, brown stuff that you don't want to drink. So you've got to do it quite carefully. And the formation of compounds depends on a lot of other things, pH, temp, other compounds that are around degradation, and it's not always predictive. And as I showed before, um, with the graph of those compounds changing in South African Riesling, different reactions happen at different rates. So not everything happens. You don't affect everything uh, similarly. But also when you do accelerated aging, you need to know what your end point is. So you can't just age it and go, yep, we did it. You have to have some goal in mind of what you're trying to get to. So luckily we've got these... Um, set of Rieslings that we looked at a, uh, a few years ago and analysed for things like alpha terpineol and TDN. <clears throat> so we can see from there that a 5 to 10 year old Riesling alpha terpineol concentration somewhere between not much and 50. For TDN, we're looking at somewhere between 50 and 150. So at least we've got a benchmark and a goal to aim towards when we're doing our accelerated ageing. So this is a graph that came out of um, a recent TR that we knocked together. Um, and this essentially just shows geraniol. So one of the, um, the monoterpenes that we know degrades quite quickly. Alpha terpineol, which is a monoterpene that we know is a bit more persistent. And TDN, which forms slowly over time. So on the very left, we've got the starting point as it was in the, the wine before we started heating it. Um, the second box there is one month of aging, so at 28 degrees and 40 degrees. And I guess you can see there that the blue bar, the geraniol hasn't really <clears throat> gone very far as has the alpha terpineol and TDN's come up a bit. So we haven't really hit those marks at 40 degrees. We still haven't lost all the geraniol, which is a bit disappointing. Alpha terpineol could probably come down a bit and TDN's in the right range, but we haven't affected all of those in the way we want. When we look at six months of aging, we're getting the terpineol <clears throat> close to where it needs to be. And the TDN is in that range we want. So that's pretty good. The geraniol is pretty much gone as we would expect. Um, 40 degrees, we've, again, we've destroyed it. We've cooked the wine. There's very little alpha terpineol and there's a ridiculous amount of TDN. So this was just that, that aging graph I showed before. This is what happens in a normal wine, four years you get reduction of young wine character and an increase in age character. What we're trying to do here is produce an environment where we push that back. So I've changed the, the, the bottom to months as well. We want to do it really quickly, but we want it to happen in a way um, that it happens 
in wine, but often when we heat wine, rather than getting a, uh, it squeezing up and happening quicker, we get things like this happening. We get those curves changing because things happen at different speed. We end up reducing young white character too quickly and kerosene ramps up more than it should, um, which is not what we're aiming for. So that started to get us thinking about <clears throat> where this extra TDN came from. Because if we can do it, you know, we're trying to predict what the TDN will be like. If we choose the wrong conditions and we say, well, this is going to be ruined, it's going to be a, a kerosene petrol bomb in five years, have we done it right? So this is that pathway that I showed before. <clears throat> the formation from a precursor with different yeasts. So a couple of people at the AWRI took, made these compounds and heated them up. At pH three, they took this compound in the box, they heated it up and they got actinidol, which is what we would expect. As soon as they took that compound and heated it at pH one, they redirected it towards TDN. They got no actinidol and they got a quite a large increase in TDN. So what we can read into from that is that if we use the wrong conditions, we can remove things from pathways they're not going down and push them back into other pathways that are more favorable under the conditions that we're using. So that means when we're trying to predict how much TDN will be made um, or how much will be in, in a bottle, what we really want to do is just push this pathway here. We just want to force it through to TDN. But what we don't want to do is take stuff from other pathways. But what we really don't want to do is take stuff that could be going towards a completely other norisoprenoid. So it could be heading towards something nice and push it towards TDN. So at the moment, we're not really sure where that balance is. We know um, that we can push stuff from the actinidol pathway into the TDN. <clears throat> we don't really know how far up that chain we're pushing things when we go too hard. So in terms of predicting aging, at this stage, there's no recommended technique. Um, and it really does depend on the question that's being asked and the compounds that are being investigated. Um, so that's, that's bad news for anyone who's trying to do accelerated aging and put it into sensory because we just don't quite get wine as we would expect it. Um, just because those things happen on different, different speeds and different scales. So we actually use a few different accelerated aging type pathways depending on what we're trying to look at. So if we're looking at juice, we generally go pretty hard and try and force as much stuff through as possible. And we don't use it as a predictor of TDN. We use it as a predictor of how much stuff is in that pathway. Um, if it's gone through fermentation, we don't want to reduce or remove that um, redirection that the yeast can have down different pathways. So we use a more mild one. But if we use that back on the juice, we may not be liberating all the TDN. So it's a, it's a bit of a balance. We also want to be looking at the monoterpenes and how those are, those are changing. And again, not all, not, they don't all change the same as nothing holistic. Um, and it should always be developed with the compounds you're looking at in mind. Um, but also we need a guiding concentration and range. So as we move into a new climate and we've got um, an increase in um, precursors, we may be stepping outside the scope of those graphs that I showed. We may be producing young wine that has more precursors than we've ever seen. So our accelerated aging may not quite work as we'd expect it to in those wines. So just a few final conclusions. I think I'm getting right near the end. Um, sun exposure from what we've seen is the key to TDN um, and the speed of how it ages. Um, if you have too much sun, you have a lot of um, uh, TDN um, potential um, and potentially speed that wine up a little bit. We have seen that you can, with a bit more sun, increase monoterpene. So you may be able to hold, hold, increase that young wine character from dropping off, um, but at some point they're going to swap over. So vineyard choices, so increasing shade um, in any way possible. Um, so whether that be by changing vineyard, um, uh, canopy structure, um, trellising type, uh, potentially um, segregating parcels. Um, potentially increasing other aromatics, so monoterpenes for the short term. Um, again, 
you know, suggests that if you increase the monoterpenes, you also increase, increase the TDN precursors. So it may be a short term thing that you can hold off in the young wine category for a bit longer, but you know, five years down the track, you probably don't want to be selling stuff. Um, winery, um, pH. Yes. Um, it changes the speed at which things are made. We're not completely on top of the end point. So is it making more of it or is it just making it faster? And in the end, the higher pH will catch up. Um, hopefully you're not storing wine for long enough that you'd have to worry about it, but it's something we're looking at. Closure it looks like it's a, um, has quite a bit impact. Um, the reason, exact reason why um, we're still investigating. And obviously yeasts can have a little bit of a play in tweaking things, um, but not doesn't seem to undo what happens in the vineyard. Um, and in terms of predicting the aging capacity, it is an absolute holy grail, not just in this work, but in, the, in wine science in general, understanding how things are going to progress and we're not quite there, even just on um, monoterpenes and TDM. So just a few quick acknowledgements. So um, Evie and Corey did a lot of this work um, before I picked it up. Um, there's obviously a lot of co-authors that put stuff into this and some industry partners that let us play around in their vineyard. So my last thing is um, question time. Um, I'm a bit of a reflective thinker. I don't come up with things straight away and I don't expect you guys to. Um, so in seven days, so next Thursday at about the same time, I've got time in my calendar to sit in on my email and answer questions. If you come up with questions at two o'clock in the morning tonight or over the weekend as a result of this, please feel free to feel free to shoot them through and I'll, I'll answer them this time next week. Thanks a lot. Back to Mike. Okay. Thank you, Josh. And thank you for uh, providing our listeners the opportunity to contact you via email. Um, I know there are a lot of reflective thinkers out there, so that's a great approach. But having said that, we will open up now to a live Q and A. So Josh is going to stick around for a little while. If you've got any questions regarding his presentation, please um, send them through. A quick reminder, if you're not sure how to do that, just click the Q and A button on your webinar toolbar. Uh, that should open up a little window and just type your questions and send it through. Um, while we're waiting, to see if we get any questions. Um, I might just quickly remind everyone that we do have a webinar next week. Um, that will be on Thursday, 6th of September. And it'll be the AWRI's Dr. Marty Longbottom who will provide a timely biosecurity update. So if you're interested in attending or registering for that session, please visit the AWRI website um, to do so. Uh, still don't have any questions come through just yet, Josh. Quick one from me though. Do you have any timeline around when you might be publishing some results from the from the trials that you discussed earlier? Um, some of the work from the 2015 has recently gone out in a, in a conference proceeding, which is um, open access, so anyone can have a look at it. <clears throat> um, the more recent stuff, so what we're doing at the moment is probably um a year away um it'll just depend on um how much whipping i do of phd students um but also once we tie off on the questions that we're asking because obviously these are not straightforward because we have those interplay of light and um temperature and things like that um we often have to do a few extra experiments here and there so often we get the bulk of what we need and then have to doing a, do a little bit of tying off just to make sure that it's all the questions have been answered and, and that sort of thing. Um, sure. But um, Evie, who's the PhD student, um, she's only got, I think, a year and a half left and I don't want to be left with all the writing. So hopefully in the next year and a half, it'll all be done and out there. Great. We'll look forward to it. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come through, so we'll, we'll get to them. Um, what other varieties show potential TDN and similar developed TDN, whites and reds? Can TDN be linked with Italian Riesling, aged Hunter Semillon, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, reds? Very good question. So I did say at the start that it's, it's generally a Riesling thing. 
Um, we've analysed for TDN in other varieties, reds and whites, and we, we do see it in a lot of varieties. Um, Riesling is just the one that it gets up to the concentration that it has a sensory impact. Um, I would say aged semions probably the other one that we, we've run through a few samples and have seen it. Um, but it doesn't appear to, to get into that, that sort of unbalanced phase from what I've seen. Um, if anyone has examples of it, um, by all means, let us know because anywhere else it's a problem, not or anywhere else that it can be um, investigated, um, you know, would be would be keen to do it. But it's generally um, generally Riesling at the moment. Great, thanks for that, Josh, and thanks for your question there, Stefan. Um, another one here. Was there any conclusions drawn from different shade cloth weights in relation to TDN and other characteristics? Does I say weight? Um, we we'll use the, the, the same weight of shade cloth each time. We just use different colours, um, and it's it's because the the carotenoids themselves absorb in a, a pretty small range in the visible spectrum and some of these shade cloths block out that range, others let it through. Um, I mean, we saw, we saw differences in, from those shade cloths in terms of even just maturity. Um, the temperature behind those shade cloths was slightly different, um, but we have seen differences in the prediction of TDN. So that total TDN reading, obviously we'll only know for sure the actual TDN differences once the wines have been in bottle for a year or two. Um, so it's hard to say, but in terms of those, those predictions that we do, we have seen differences in those, those different shade cloths. But that's right. No, go on. No. Okay. Um, another question here. Has there been any work on sun exposure, phenolics and TDN? <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question. Um, not that's springing up, not in the same category. I've seen some work out of um, the Geisenheim people where they've been looking at, at phenolics and um, Riesling typicality and see a bit of a change in um, Riesling typicality rating with changes in phenolics. Um, it's probably just some matrix effects and partitioning how much it lets up into the the headspace but nothing that's coming to mind at the moment but there is always um work on um changes in um the impact of oxygen on wine with the phenolics around because obviously if we're talking about some pathways changed with with oxidation or not without, without oxidation then um, things like catechins and flavanthriols can have an impact on on how oxygen's used in that system. Okay, another question here. Do you think oxygen SO2 levels are involved in the development of TDN in, in the bottle? Um, have you tasted some wine bottled under cork and screw, tap, screw cap after time? And just another quick one here. In my experience, amount of TDN it's more likely under cork. So a few questions there. Yep. Okay. I'll try and cover off on all of that. I'm sure Mike, Mike will give me a nudge if I don't get it right. So I'm going to go to the cork um, screw cap type thing first. Yes, we do have a look at wines that are under cork and screw cap. Um, this is this is where we start to um, poke holes in the in some of the the preconceived notions because what we see in in wine under cork is that we still get a kerosene character so we, we give it to sensory panels and they come back and say yep kerosene usually they just say tdn because they know that they know what they think is responsible when we analyze for it we don't actually find tdn so we're at the stage now where tdn is a marker for aged um riesling in most of the Australian wines, it appears to be well correlated with kerosene, um, but there are situations that we've seen that, that start to make us um, rethink some of the things we've known, and cork is one of them. So um, recently, we've grabbed a whole bunch of, a vertical series of, of German wine 
um, all the way back to the mid 90s. And a lot of those are, are being rated for kerosene and we're seeing nearly no TDN. Um, at the moment, we have a couple of bottles of wine from the late 90s that are Australian um, that are under both screw cap and cork, but we're only just about to open those and start poking around. So the benefit there is we have the same wine um, bottled at the same time under two different closures. Whereas usually when we go back over vertical series, it's, you know, the, the early 10 of them are under cork and the late 10 are under screw cap. We have to see what the trends are and how they change with that change in closure. Um, what were some of those other? No, I've got it in front of me. Um, oxygen SO2. Um, yes, I think so. I think the pathways um, to the formation of TDN, um, there's a lot of room in those pathways for oxygen to have an impact. I can't say how big that impact is. Um, on the formation of TDN itself, um, I would have thought um, you would see a significant difference by changing oxygen levels. That's also one of the things we're starting to investigate with that closure difference, whether if, if it isn't scalping, then what's oxygen playing? Um, but those also have quite a big impact on the perception of TDN. Um, so not so much impacting TDN, but what else is around it. So we know that, um, so beta damascanone is quite a, um, an impactful odorant in a lot of wines. Um, it has a direct impact in terms of its aroma of stewed apple, but it also has an indirect impact in terms of it's good at um, boosting um, flavor. We also know one of the key routes for damascanone disappearing is um, sulfur adducts. Um, so it may be that sulfur has, an, it has uh, the effect of reducing other compounds, which lets the, the TDN character shine through. I think that covers those few questions. Again, if I haven't, feel free to send me an email and we can back and forth a bit further. No, that's great. I think you did well there, Josh. Um, we might leave it there. Don't have any further questions. Um, Josh, did you have any final comments before we wrap up? Uh, no, I don't. I just watch this space and, you know, we're here to, um, to help out the industry. So, you know, don't even hesitate to drop me an email on anything. Um, that's, that's what we're here to do to answer the, the scientific questions. So don't, don't hesitate, please. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Josh. Um, a very informative and comprehensive session and I hope was um, useful to all our listeners out there. Um, and I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for participating in today's session. Um, every attendee will receive a follow-up email with a link to this recording. Um, feel free to contact Josh directly should you have any further questions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the next webinar is on the 6th of September and it is Biosecurity Current and Future with Dr. Marty Longbottom presenting. Um, thank you again for participating in today's session and I look forward to seeing you at the next AWRI webinar.